I'm Asha Tomlinson. This is Being Black in Canada. In this edition, we walk the path paved by black activists in this country. We meet men and women who found different ways, quietly in a theater or loudly on the streets to fight injustice. Each part of a long line of black Canadians who challenge privilege and power. We begin more than half a century ago with the story of a Nova Scotia businesswoman who just wanted to see a movie. Viola Desmond's decision to take a stand against segregation changed history and inspired her sister Wanda to right the wrongs of the past. Viola's story is the subject of a brand new Canadian Heritage Minute marking Black History Month. All I wanted was to see a movie. One down, please. I can't sell downstairs tickets to you people. How dare they? How dare they? Exactly what she would say. I run How my own dare. business. Her sister's story in a Heritage Minute. Many call Viola Desmond a quiet revolutionary. But to Wanda Robson, the youngest in a family of 11, Vi will always be big sis. Viola looked out for me and my brother Jackie. We lived on the corner of Blanchardton and Gary Street, two, two flats. So we moved up where the family had dwindled down to just I and my brother by that time. Viola and her, she was married then, so they took the first flat and they had the they had no living room. That that was the beauty parlor and the kitchen and that that's what that's how she started. The people were coming, you could hear them coming and going all the time. Owning her beauty salon did not come easily. Viola was denied formal training in Halifax because of the color of her skin. So she trained in Montreal, New York, even Atlantic City, and learned from the likes of Madame CJ Walker, the first black female millionaire. Back in Canada, Viola opened up her salon, set up a school to develop other black beauticians, and created her own beauty products. She spent hours, sometimes days, traveling across the Maritimes, delivering them to clients. Viola was on one of her product runs November 8, 1946, when her car broke down in New Glasgow. She decided to see a movie, and that changed the course of history. I could afford to buy the more expensive ticket. I run my own business. The uh, usher came up and said, Miss, you're, you're sitting in the wrong seat. You can't sit there. She said, oh, that's the seat. It's, uh, it's more expensive. You, you, so Viola said, well, I'll go and I'll pay the difference. But they refused to take my money. She said, I always sit down when I'm in Halifax. She went down and sat down. And the usher came again and said, I'll have to get the manager. Viola said, get the manager. I'm not doing anything wrong. The uh, manager took one arm and took the other, dragging her up, and she lost a shoe and a purse, and somebody picked and retrieved them. The policeman called a taxi. The manager went to the courts to get an order for her arrest. Now, arrest for what? She goes to prison, and one thing I say, she was in jail, they take her to jail. I said, Viola, you know, jail. I mean. What did, what, what did you do? They said I didn't pay the theater tax, but it was really about color. She made this, I think, was a conscious uh, response of rebellion. I'm not doing this. And I think the impact for me was um, to show how a small act can become something even bigger. Former Lieutenant Governor May Ann Francis was a part of that bigger moment decades later, issuing a pardon to Viola Desmond in April 2010, a request initiated in writing by Viola's younger sister. She knew an injustice was, was, was done to her sister, and she fought to make sure that it was undone in her lifetime. So it was um, a very moving uh, experience for me um, knowing that I was the one, a black woman, was going to be um, given Viola Desmond something that she should have had a long time ago, um, her, her, her freedom. I remember my heart was just beating away, um, and it was so many people, so many cameras, and I kept thinking, this is for you, Viola. And there she is. As fate would have it, May Ann Francis lives next to the Camp Hill Cemetery in Halifax, where Viola was buried in 1965. Viola I. Davis Desmond, 
1914-1965. She made it her mission to have Viola's gravesite officially marked with signs. She's also responsible for this. A portrait of Viola hanging on the government house walls. And this was Wanda Robson's response, seeing it for the first time. Wanda looks at it and then she goes up closer and she says, hi, Vi. You know, yeah, she put her hand up and she said, hi, Vi. It was really mean. The pardon, the portrait, the graveside markers, it all leads back to Wanda and her quest for justice. My family had a front row. And this is what we got. A framed copy of the pardon hangs at the front of Wanda's home, keeping her sister's memory, her place in history nearby. And if Viola was alive to see it today. She'd read it. And she'd say, Money, money. Did you do that? I'd say with a lot of help. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And I love you very much. That's what she'd say. She is something else. I loved her. In a newly released book, Wanda shares more stories about her big sister, Viola. It's called Viola Desmond's Canada. Still ahead on being black in Canada, from a woman who just wanted to see a movie, to men and women who just wanted to feel safe in their city. We were in a war, a civil war against every institution. Hello, I'm Asha Tomlinson. Welcome back to Being Black in Canada. We're tracing the footsteps of black activists in this country. Next, a group of people who took to the streets to take on the cops and the courts. This is the story of the Black Action Defense Committee. The Young Street Riots, Toronto, May 1992. A response to the acquittal of four white police officers in the beating of Rodney King. This was one of the largest anti-racist demonstrations against police brutality. And it started out peacefully. But tensions were high and those tensions boiled over, leading to chaos in the streets. It wasn't just anger over what was happening stateside. There was a growing list of black men shot dead by police in Canada. Raymond Lawrence, Michael Wade Lawson, Lester Donaldson. The officers say that they came into this room, that they found Lester Donaldson on a bed, that he was threatening them with a knife, and that he refused their command to surrender the knife right away. Donaldson was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and had a number of run-ins with police. And his shooting was so egregious that it stirred a kind of an anger that people hadn't. We were angry before, but we felt that the society doesn't care about us and so. And then the, the police officer who shot him, not only was he cleared again, it was quite routine to be cleared by white jurors, but he came out when he won the case with a cigar in his mouth, wearing cowboy boots. And that got a good people. It's, it, it was like a twerk to people. Donaldson's death was the catalyst for change. It brought black community leaders together, including Lennox Farrell, Charles Roach, Sharona Hall, Dudley Laws. And they formed the Black Action Defense Committee, also known as BADC. It got started, from what I recall, as an act of defiance. That's why the word defense is in it, and action. We never set out, set out to be extraordinary. We were ordinary people doing things which we wanted to have a sense of normalcy. I wanted to leave my home, go out and come back with the police pulling me over because I look like somebody. That's all we wanted to do. We as citizens, black and white, 
cannot condone the actions of these police officers. Dudley was a unique character, an uh, activist. He's first and foremost, he's a passionate Garveyite. Dudley Laws drew much of his inspiration from the revolutionary black nationalist Marcus Garvey. And it didn't take long for Laws to become the face of Batsy, bringing attention to police brutality and racism in the force. But let the courts understand very clearly we will not condone the injustices of the courts of Ontario. The passion and the belief and the pride and his work in trying to uplift others and to support those who were in need of support, who didn't have a voice. He was the voice for the voiceless. We as a people will not tolerate and condone these murderous actions of their police forces. People who never attended a Batsy meeting, when they got in the conflict with the boss or something, would say, I'm going to bring the laws, and they got, they got justice. Because he was that kind of good terror. It was for freedom and justice, ring and glory and young. Yeah. Now, when Dudley passed, a lot of people gave some deep thought to what he had accomplished and what Bad C was about. They started to realize, yeah, we weren't comfortable with everything, but we benefited from the work of Dudley and the sacrifice of the members of Bad C. We have advanced as a community. I say we, the black community. And I say we in the larger sense, every community benefited. And one day in this city, you will see an independent civilian investigator. Well, what we were experiencing, more and more people who are not black began to understand. And it, it triggered something in them. They came to our side. And uh, ironically, that is among the things which finally forced the government to come to a table, very much like this table here, a table like this. And there were people up and down it to form the SIU. The Black Action Defense Committee is calling for the formation of a province-wide permanent independent civilian review board. Yes. Batsy's continued calls for action led to major police reform in 1990, the creation of Ontario's Special Investigations Unit, an independent body that probes police shootings, the first of its kind in Canada. But they made it very clear from the beginning, some of the minions for the um, premier at the time, that uh, the people who would sit on that board would be those who could work within the system. When our children are out, we fear that they'll be picked up by police, and we die slowly as parents. It affects our health. Racism kills. Racism kills. And to see what, what it has become today, is a, um, a travesty, really. Dudley created something net new, and it became net better. Could it be better? Absolutely. Where are the Dudley laws and the bad seas of today to continue to hold the SIU and the, the general justice system to higher and higher levels of account? That's the question that should be asked. Not the value of what was created by Dudley, but who's coming up next to increase the value that Dudley created for us. Still ahead, who is picking up the legacy left by Canada's historic activists? We meet three young people fighting for change in unconventional ways. That's next on Being Black in Canada. What do we want the world to look like? How do we want to interact? What do we want those one-on-one -on -one conversations to be about in the future, if not this? <laughs> Welcome back to Being Black in Canada. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Next, we meet three people who are creating a roadmap for change to come. Cyrus Marcus Ware is an artist and a community activist. Sandy Hudson is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter in Toronto. And Desmond Cole, a writer, is best known for taking on the issue of police carding. Here's my conversation with them. Earlier in the program, Sandy, we profiled the Black Action Defense Committee, and the face of that organization was Dudley Laws. He became that go-to person for help, for change. Who's filling that role today? I think that uh, people are 
you know, in Toronto, there's so many different activist communities and people are going to who they know within their community. And I think it's important to encourage this kind of community building approach to uh, seeking resources, seeking help and assistance when you need it. It doesn't necessarily need to be this one place that everybody goes and I think that it's safer when it's not. You know, to have different points of access for people is safer in that those different groups, um, you know, are, they exist within a community and they're not just alone and on their own and uh, vulnerable to attack and targeting. Um, but it's also safer for people who are going to access um, uh, that resource because they're more familiar with them. It's part of their community. It's something uh, that they feel safe going to. And I think that that's very, very important um, for people. Mm -hmm. Desmond, how has social media changed black activism? I think it's been huge. Sometimes I get surprised actually because I'll just put some thoughts out about something that's going on in our communities on social media. And suddenly I have reporters calling me or I have somebody getting angry because of something that I said and I remember, oh my gosh, like this is a powerful tool. It's become more powerful as time has gone on for all of us and I think we rely on it. Um, social media can be deceptive, however, as well um, because the real work is not happening there. The real work is happening in communities. It's happening in small groups of people. The real work often sometimes is just meeting one-on-one -on -one with folks, meeting face-to-face -face and building relationships and talking. And social media can enable that, but it doesn't get you all of the way there. The real work has to go well beyond just what gets retweeted or what gets on a Facebook message. Cyrus, you use art as a tool for activism. How does that inspire future generations? Well, one of the great things about art is that it can be a relatively non-threatening inroad for people. So you can kind of get somebody uh, engaged in an aesthetic conversation. Maybe they love the way that the eyes are drawn in a portrait. Maybe they um, you know, are really interested in sort of the technique or, or, or the scale of the work. And they get drawn in, and then you find out actually the work is all about Black Lives Matter, or the work is all about you know, sort of supporting activism in, in this country. That's what a lot of my work is about, is about celebrating activism and activist lives. It's a way of kind of opening a conversation, beginning something, getting it started, that, that feels familiar, maybe welcoming. Um, I think it can be a really exciting tool that way because it's a way of starting something. Um, one of the things that we, I think, really need to do in our activism is to not only focus on the things that we want to change, but to start to paint a picture, yes. perhaps literally, about what kind of future communities we want to live in. Mm -hmm. What do we want the world to look like? How do we want to interact? What do we want those one-on-one -on -one conversations to be about in the future, if not this. And artists can be really great tools for that because they have, I mean, that's what they spend their days doing is sort of imagining and um, creating possible futures. If you could say something to a person who believes there is no longer a need for black activism in Canada, how would you respond to that? In Canada, there's this myth of this country being this place where people ran away to be free, uh, black people did, and it's the it's this haven. And you know, if you just you know, there, maybe there's some problems in your community, but like just work you know work hard and you'll be fine. And I think people need to understand that 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 history, that telling of history in that way, is a myth. You know, even even the prevalent thinking of there were no plantations here, there weren't as many slaves here. <laughs> you know, that is. That is uh, powerfully wrong thinking, <laughs> and it's it is, and I choose the word powerfully very intentionally. It's powerful that that thinking is powerful and has been ingrained in the minds of people for years and years, and it creates a situation where people think there's nothing owed to us that reparations aren't something that should be talked about here. But uh, let's be clear: Canada didn't always exist as Canada. And it didn't matter where the plantations were, the money, the capital, it still built this place. We're still benefiting off of black labor, benefiting off of indigenous land. And that continues today. 
And the effects of that we see most urgently in uh, police brutality. We see it in education. We see it in the mental health of our community, all sorts of different things. So to that person, I'd say, open your eyes, please. <laughs> or just walk away and not talk to them at all. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what else, you know what else is important about that too, though? Now, everybody talks about the 60s and the civil rights movement, and they're talking about the United States. So they're not talking about deadly laws. They're not talking about Viola Desmond. Mm -hmm. They're not mm -hmm. talking about people in this country. Yeah. So yeah. they're talking about this mythical past. And I think that people, especially white people, have the idea that all the white folks were with Dr. King. That all the white folks saw that somebody sat down at the front of the bus and were like, yeah, you know, it's about time. People hated that. Just like they hate our activism, resent our activism today, mm -hmm. the general public back then resented Dr. King, resented Malcolm X, resented people who fought back. Nothing has changed. People tell stories to make themselves so better all the time. Mm -hmm. So everyone's relative was helping someone on the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. Everyone went to the March on Washington I mean, 100,000 people went, that's significant. But if everybody went who says that they went, a million and a half people would have been there. Everybody was always involved. And the truth is, is that that's not the case. Um, you know, this is part of why I've been doing these, these uh, artistic you know, explorations of activism, because I'm very curious about the choices when you choose to get involved. Because not everybody is choosing to get involved. And as you say, not everybody was, you know, out there supporting Dr. King or supporting any of these people. We want every single person in Canada, whether they are black or not, to be able to have housing, to be able to eat, to be able to get an education, to be able to determine their own future. We fight for ourselves on our basis because of our experience. But this is a fight for everyone. Enlightening conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Desmond. Thank you. If you want to know more about any of our stories, join the conversation online using the hashtag BeingBlackInCanada. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Thanks for watching.